Last hurrah for Contango this season. On Sunday, we're gonna do a long motor to Port Faden. Get up early so we can haul out and store it so we'll be ready to go for season three of slow boat sailing where we're going to visit places like Bora Bora and Tonga. If you want to see more of the round the world adventure on the slow boat, don't forget to subscribe down below and hit the bell icon so you can get notified when our new round the world vlogs come out. The 70 foot boat that was anchored in front of us was dragging and instead of uh, waiting for them to drag more, we were back down really well, uh, but they had come like 30 or 40 feet closer than the prior night, even though it was light winds. So instead of waiting until it, something bad happened at night, I decided to pick up anchor as soon as it, I had room. The other problem was that I had dropped the anchor like amidships and on amidships on a instead of off their stern and so if the wind angle was just right in the morning I wouldn't be able to get out until the wind shifted so I wanted to make sure that I could anchor uh, pick up anchor in the morning really early because I have a 50 mile trip to Port Faden so we can haul out. So we were there and we went up here into the head of the bay where there's only one other boat anchored. There's 20 boats anchored there. This is a really safe anchorage up in the front of the bay. And nobody's gonna bother you. Today we're motoring out of Morea Miandeli. This is our last sail of the season if all goes well. And we get hauled out on Monday. It is Sunday, so I wanna get in there before dark. And I also wanna have time to change the oil before bedtime so that we can have clean oil for when we haul out. So if you've changed any oil on boats through a dipstick, it's a lot easier to do after the engine has been running for 10 to 20 minutes. So it's a little bit hot and it's, uh, it can get sucked out a lot easier. So that's why you want to change the oil before you haul out because you can't run the engine when you're hauled out and you have no uh, water cooling, which are the, all the engines are water cooled. And if you're not in the water, you can't cool them. Say goodbye to Jurassic Park. Seems like I made the right call so far to go around the western side of Morea and instead of going straight into the squalls heading east towards Tahiti. That added three miles to our overall trip, but I'm not sure that uh, going the direct route straight into the squalls would have been any quicker because the waves would have been against us. So I think this is a much smoother ride, much safer ride, much more comfortable ride much drier ride and uh, hopefully the squalls are going to pass to the north of us which it looks like they will. One replacement that would be good to have is the shaft key, which is one quarter inch, and if that I was able to find it in the bilge. Okay, so you definitely want to put the shaft key in first, and then it'll be a lot easier to put in the bolt. You also want to slow down the boat, and that's what I've done. I've been luffing. So as you can hear, the engine is back on and the motor is running. 
So I was able to replace the uh, screw. I had uh, two spares. So, so I put in one of them and I was also put in the key. Uh, when I stop, if I have time, I'll try to tighten down the said screws. I, I didn't do that because I was rushing a bit. We were just between the reefs and the, the entrance to Port Bay when it happened. We were just about to turn a T7 towards T8 and then we had to tack out to sea. This has been one of the trickiest entrances I've ever can remember. It had a, uh, very quick turns on it. There was a lot of unmarked reefs. Uh, you, you can see the breakers everywhere. And uh, on top of that, the fishermen put their floats in the middle of the pass. So you had one thing to wrap your prop on. Look at all those hazards. You can see the other boat on the trailer uh, right now, so it's going to be fairly soon that we're going to have to let go of the mooring lines and get hauled out. So you can kind of make out the red keeled boat in the distance. It's a really good day to do it. It's very calm in the anchorage here. The water is calm. So my episode 35 guest, Greg Cutson of Mantis Marine and Mantis Anchors, uh, he said that he was hauled out on a very choppy day in Panama City and he had damage to his boat. So uh, that's always something that you don't want to do when you're using a sled or uh, if you're uh, using anything. The choppier the conditions, the more dangerous it is to haul out. But you can see the, the water behind me, it's a mirror, so glassy calm, perfect. My mooring lines are all tangled up here. I'm just waiting here. Uh, I'm holding the mooring line. I'm waiting to see movement on the other boat that's splashing. Uh, it seems like they're still undoing the lines. The uh, but, you know, my mooring line was all tangled up in the morning, so it would have taken, you know, five minutes to untangle it. So I'm just holding this, and we'll see how long it takes. If it takes really long, I'll tie up the mooring line. The reason why you want to be on top of this is because in Hiva Oa, kind of poor communications between me and the yard manager uh, meant that we had to wait several days uh, to uh, get splashed until he was going to splash another boat. Uh, so a lot of yards, they only like to, to pull one in and take one out at the same time because they have to pay a lot of extra personnel to do the splashing, and so they want to pay them all at the same time. It makes sense for them. Uh, so it's not like, oh, uh, if we poorly communicated, they're going to they're gonna bring out the sled again. No, it takes a lot of uh, work for them to, to arrange to have uh, the people to run the sled or the 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 boat uh, trailer and so if you miss your appointment or you're a little late or there's poor communication then uh, you could wait several days and obviously if you have plane tickets or anything like that that complicates the process so in Hiva Oa like on December 29th right before the big weekend of uh, of the New Year's weekend. They were splashing a boat, but poor communication. The yard owner didn't know that we were there and we couldn't get anybody to respond, uh, even though I'd kind of emailed his wife a lot. 
meant that they didn't pick us up when they splashed another boat. And so I had to wait until, you know, January 2nd was the next time, right? So after the holiday weekend, uh, you know, and that, that was a bit of a bummer, uh, but uh, it was okay. And uh, so that's probably why you wanna put a little extra wiggle room time uh, if you're gonna haul out for the season uh, because you know you could have uh, unforeseen delays other delays would be weather delays you know if it were really choppy conditions they might call off for instance the splashing and the hauling out so uh, you do have to get to the yard a little bit earlier than maybe you would want to I see the boat moving now so I'm gonna let go of the mooring lines Tied up on the starboard side, we're in about 5.8 foot depths. So we have a four foot keel, uh, although I think my depth sounder will go down to 3.2 before the four foot keel drops. So that's probably like two and a half feet below our keel where we're tied up here at the back of the ramp. Okay, so we're tied up at uh, 5.8 foot depths according to my Garmin but because I think it's calibrated wrong, 3.2 is probably four foot depths. So 3.2 minus 5.8 is about 2.6. And so there's probably about 6.6 .6 feet under my keel over uh, two meters at this moment right here. All in the Society Island, so uh, the tidal range won't get you a lot more depth here. So if you've got an eight foot keel, you're probably not gonna be able to come in here. So the tractor is actually chained to the ground so it's not pulled into the slip. I haven't seen that before. That's pretty interesting. So the tractor is going to stay in place, uh, but it just pulls in the uh, metal line, or the steel line to pull in the boat. This is the, uh, their second attempt to adjust the sled. I think the first time they had to get out some tools to get the, the sled height right and uh, we'll, we'll see if it's uh, up to what makes them feel comfortable this time. So one of the most essential things you could do when storing a boat for a long time and leaving it for a long time is to take off the Genoa. Uh, I'm from Louisiana and 
we get a lot of tropical storms, we get a lot of uh, hurricanes that come through. And one of the things that always happens when a storm comes through is a lot of boats that left their Genoa's on, uh, those things get uh, ripped to shreds and it is a nightmare to take them off. It's a, it's a thousand dollar job to have a rigger take uh, Genoa off when it's wrong. So you can see where the paint's been rubbed off and some of the fiberglass has also been scratched where the propeller fell out. Today I'm taking off the wheel pilot, which is a Raymarine wheel pilot. We had two of those fail on the Pacific crossing between Ecuador and Hivo and the Marquesas of French Polynesia. I, I've had good success with this, uh, although I think a lot of other people who maybe, uh, maybe go out in bigger conditions than I tend to go out in or uh, don't reef as early as I do or don't balance the sails uh, have had these fail more often. The motor on the Ray Marine is kind of small it's kind of like a printer motor almost. Uh, so if you don't have a balanced sail plan, it, it can fail. It's probably not a great thing to take to the Southern Ocean, for example. But I have a, a spare one of these, a brand new one that is a total spare for the wheel pilot. And I like using it, um, but uh, with a lot of deliberation, we got the CPT wheel pilot. The CPT wheel pilot, unfortunately, it needs to go in the same place that the Ray Marine does. So I'm taking off the Ray Marine to put on the CPT. I don't plan to keep the CPT on. I plan to take it back off, but I'm putting it on so I can install the electronics. So if I do have like a double failure of the Ray Marine or we have a little bit bigger conditions, then that's a viable option that within several hours I'd be able to get the CPT up and running but I'd first have to take off the Ray Marine. Uh, my wife and I decided against the linear drive models which you know would be a good complement to this that the you know one of the stumbling blocks for a linear drive model is that you need to Number one, you need to fiberglass a stand, a special made stand for them. The other thing is that uh, the only install that I got information on of another person with my boat involved drilling the rudder shaft, and I did not feel comfortable about drilling the rudder shaft, and my wife, Jana, really did not feel comfortable about drilling the rudder shaft. So uh, I, get, I think the installation for the non-wheel pilots is a lot, a lot more serious. You know, the other options that we could have done uh, would be, for instance, a, a wind vane. But the wind vane pros problems for us too because we have a stern ladder. We would have to move our stern ladder and uh, I didn't want to move the stern ladder. I like the stern ladder so that's why we didn't consider that. The other thing is those things are very heavy very difficult to put on a, a in luggage so uh, I, I was gonna hold off on that you know I think I'll revisit the autopilot decision um, even if we don't have major problems when we're thinking about the Indian Ocean crossing around the Cape of Good Hope we might get a, a wind vane say in Australia or something but right now I didn't think it was the time To the installation of the CPT autopilot. Uh, I'd say it's probably taken me about 10 to 12 hours to get to the point where it starts working. Uh, so I mean, you know, these guys are, are over optimistic, I'd say, about how long it takes. But I'm pretty happy with that. It was a fairly easy installation. Problem, I'd say, with the CPT, just from installing it, 
is that this wheel mechanism here, you've got a, a belt and the belt does not stick out very much from the wheel. So if they made this wheel mechanism thicker, uh, the part that doesn't have the belt, then uh, it would be much easier to disengage the clutch without the belt rubbing against the wheel. But as it is, it rubs against the wheel uh, when it's disengaged, which is okay. You're probably not gonna be doing tons of steering, but it, it just makes me less inclined to use the CPT as my primary autopilot, whereas there's no type that, there's not that type of issue uh, with the Ray Marine. So you can see how narrow that is. And that's the room that you have to disengage the clutch. And that's not enough. Okay, you can see when the clutch is disengaged, you're kind of rubbing against the wheel. But when it's not, there's enough room. So what they forgot, I think, with the CPT and not making the, the wheel attachment big enough is that the wheel is bigger than the spokes and uh, they need to give you extra room for that and they have not. To engage the autopilot, I have to make sure that the rudder is uh, not on zero so it has some rudder response and the higher the more responsive and then I go from the switch that says hold steady or standby so it starts out on standby and it's not going to turn and then I hit hold heading and then it should turn especially when I change the heading. Right, so I did plus 10 now the wheel is turning. Hit hold heading you see the green light Maybe minus 10, change the setting. Turn it off, we hit standby. So this is kind of like day three of the autopilot install and then deinstall. So my plan is to use the the CPT, I've taken off the wheel unit for the CPT and the belt, and I've got it ready so that I can install it relatively quickly, say in an hour or less. And uh, so if I have an autopilot failure or the Ray Marine, so if I have two Ray Marines burnout or maybe one burnout and I just want to try something different, I can uh, put this in fairly quickly at sea. So I think I've probably got better use out of the Rain Marine than other people that have gone kind of longer distances with them. Um, you know, before the the Pacific Crossing, it was probably something like at least 8,000 miles or something before the first one failed. But I, I would say that I just, you know, I this, this is the slow boat. So we do take it slow. We try not to go out in big weather. We try not to uh, over tax the autopilot. And I probably got more out of it than probably a lot of other sailors who go out in kind of bigger conditions. So our friends on uh, the island packet Morpheus of London, uh, who we saw in Papiete and in Hiva Oa, they, they had an autopilot failure and it really ruined their Pacific Crossing much worse than ours and uh, they were pretty shell-shocked I think afterwards so having backup all autopilots and backup plans for them are very important uh, you know hand steering even just for that one 24-hour period was very difficult my watches hand steering it was just very exhausting to do the hand steering downwind. It was not nearly as efficient as the autopilot when I was doing it. So in addition to the CPT and then the Ray Marine, uh, the two wheel pilots with Ray Marine, I'm going to look into, uh, you know, 
I've, we've got this SeaTac Benmar, which is a really old version of an autopilot. It doesn't work very well, and I'm going to look into seeing if I can uh, replace that unit because it has a fairly nice setup in that it's a different setup than the wheel pilots. It controls the wheel from uh, behind the quadrant, so the quadrant is in the, the seat section of the helm, and the quadrant turns the rudder, and so it has like a bike wheel behind the quadrant, uh, and then it uses a bike chain and a motor, and I, I like that setup because it's a different type of setup, and it'd be nice if we could get some use out of the SeaTech Benmar. Right now, it's just really, uh, it, it'll, it'll engage, uh, but then it, it does some really crazy stuff. So I'll email or call them when I get back to the States and, and see if I can get a replacement unit or if it's still, if they're out of business essentially, uh, then I'll maybe look more closely on eBay for used ones. But I've all had such terrible luck with eBay. I'd prefer to buy new if it's uh, anywhere close to. Ray Marine's working the way it should. We'll start out the season next season with the Ray Marine autopilot because that's what I'm more comfortable with. But we'll see how the CPT does, especially with our long ocean passages. And uh, if the if the Ray Marine fails us, we may switch to that as our primary.